Welcome to episode 163 of Tim Talk, the podcast about the DC animated universe co-created by Bruce Tim. I'm Chris Lord. I'm Cameron Dexter. And it's finally happened. Four years in. Justice League. Oh, I thought it was they were back in the same spot recording. Oh, that too, yeah. <laughs> I know. So so many milestones in one episode. We're we're back in the same room recording once again. Yes, the very hot inferno that is an la apartment right now yo yeah la over labor day weekend uh, has not been pleasant everybody which some of you already know this for other <laughs> of you you're like oh i don't care i'm in air conditioning it's fine or yeah, it's not 107 <laughs> lucky for you guys but we are back together uh on top of that we just had our fourth podversary cameron happy podversary happy podversary i know four years in uh, it was very smart of you four years ago to decide to release our first episode to coincide with the anniversary of btos yeah. Because now I can have all the rest of Twitter remind me that anniversary is happening, which then reminds me, oh, shit, that's ours, too. <laughs> I mean, it's having having overlapped holidays. Definitely. My, my mom famously uh, made my stepdad propose to her on her birthday. <laughs> so neither of them can ever forget the anniversary. But if he ever does, he's doubly fucked. Exactly. <laughs> and I remember because it's the day after Mickey's birthday. <laughs> Congratulations, Cameron. <laughs> yes. Makes everything uh, very easy. Makes everything so much easier. Uh, but yeah, so we had our, our, our podversary, which is very exciting. Had some, some lovely messages from people. For Thank you, everyone who sent that in. And then, of course, we are starting off on Justice League, which I I feel like now this that I think about it, this is probably the show I've been most excited to get to. I, I think so, too. I, I was As we were watching it, I realized, like, I don't know how much we can really talk about because we've been talking about these episodes for four years already. <laughs> or what we remember of them for four years. Yeah. Because we, we've both actively avoided watching anything DCAU until it comes up in, in our rotation. Um, but, like, I was happy to see it. It held up just as much as I was hoping it mm-hmm. would. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm super excited about this. And maybe part of it, too, is that that last season of Static Shock just, like left me a little underwhelmed okay that's fair yeah i mean i think we established like season three was like peak static and, absolutely and season four was uh eh, maybe not quite so much there um but no no super super excited to be getting into just league and just league limited um which also like it's kind of the the last stretch here in a lot I of know, ways i was gonna say too did, four years ago did you think we would actually make it this far i always thought we'd make it but based on my original projection we were supposed to be done by now <laughs> really yes because we've had so many bonus episodes yeah and then there was that period we were doing every other week so oh that's right so it, then uh, the, the 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 titan season one we only did one tv oh. episode and one titans episode god that was a that was a rough time Wait, did that, <laughs> you I were so mad about everything <laughs> I feel like there was just a bad stretch there it's like we were covering titans then we were covering zeta and it was mm-hmm. just like oh man dark days but bright days ahead here yes. uh justice league super super excited about that but before for we... next week because that's darkest nights blackest night blackest nights come on cameron it's a green lantern episode you it still is. couldn't get the title right <laughs> I know. shame shame on you but before we get into Secret Origin, the three-part premiere of Justice League, uh, not a lot of news this week, but a little bit. Um, very noteworthy that this was kind of the first weekend when the U.S. box office was sort of open again mm-hmm. um, and actually had movies come out that people wanted to see, or let's be honest, one movie that came out that people wanted to see and another movie that we have been assuming would never make it to theaters to begin with. Yes. Mulan and Mulan. <laughs> oh, I forgot about Mulan too, right? <laughs> I was teeing you up to do your favorite segment of New Mutant News. Yes, New Mulan News. <laughs> yes, no, New Mutants did officially come out last week. We we both, as we pressed the stop record button, we both remembered, like, oh, fuck, we didn't talk about, <laughs> didn't New, Mutants talk about New Mutants at all. <laughs> but now we can. It is it is here. It is the, the light of the world. It is it is shown its light on the world, as we will say. Uh, and wow, is that light dim dim yeah um so i i haven't read any like full length reviews i've been kind of just seeing like little bits and pieces here and there and kind of going off word of mouth but a lot of people are saying this is the worst x-men movie yet which is so incredible that that is keep in mind everyone a very very low bar yes um lest we forget i think in apocalypse <laughs> apocalypse dark phoenix dark phoenix x-men origins wolverine oh my god i mean like it, it, for those of us who remember seeing 
X Men: The Last Stand in 2006 when it came out, and being like, "Oh man, that was bad." Like, oh, I loved Last Stand when it came in, out. In hindsight, now you're like, actually, there's some good stuff in here because yeah. <laughs> the bar just kept getting lower and lower. Now, again, we haven't seen it, so we can't verify if it's actually that bad or not. Um, but it's not a great sign, and clearly Disney had no faith in this because they just dumped it into a theatrical market where no one can really go and see it. Anyone we know has gone and seen it in a drive-in, um, which is kind of an expensive way to go, and pretty much everyone who I've talked to said, don't bother, mm-hmm. <laughs> which means we're not going to bother. I mean, you're not going to bother. <laughs> Are you going to go? <laughs> I, I keep thinking about it. I've never done a drive-in experience. I don't I think I like have either, actually. Just like going in on this most sour-tasting movie <laughs> is is a great entry point, because it's only going to get better. Every drive-in experience after that is only going to get better. I suppose that's true. It's, it's a good way to like get, it out, get this movie out of the way, figure out how to deal with the drive-in, let the stress hang over this shit film, and then the next time you want to do it, it'll be a better experience. Exactly. Oh, fuck. All right. Well, if you go, let me know and oh, maybe I'll come along. Yeah. But I'm not driving, so that way I can drink. Oh, no. That's, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, this is, it is not doing well. So worldwide so far, it's made 12 million, which I guess. Wow. Uh, I mean, it's, look, it's impossible to know what this would have done if it had come out on any of the other scheduled release dates it had and or not even in COVID streaming. times. Or streaming. Yeah. But I, I think my understanding is that Disney couldn't put it straight to streaming due to contractual obligations when they bought Fox. Right. The part of the contract was it had to go to theaters first. So I imagine their whole thing is like, well, fuck it. We'll just dump it in the theaters. And then as soon as possible, get it up onto VOD. So people can start watching it at home. So yeah, it, except now no one wants to watch it. No one wants to watch it. That's a good point. Actually, if they just gone straight to streaming, more people would be like, well, let's see what it's about. And yeah. then, you know, it's a real cats don't dance situation, isn't it? I'm sorry, how is this a cat's... I mean, everything for you could become a cat's do dance situation, but please walk me through the mental steps that led you to deciding this is a cat's don't dance situation. So funny enough, cat's don't dance was in the exact same situation. Oh, it came out during a pandemic? Uh, No, but it was... It was supposed to go to streaming first. Yes, back in 1995. (laughs) But of course, no one trusted it because it took Mm -hmm. days to load up the first first musical number. No, so Warner Brothers bought out Fox Animation... Uh, while this movie was finishing production, mm-hmm. WB had no faith in the movie, but under contractual agreement, they had to release it in theaters. Uh, and so they basically just did a very inexpensive guerrilla marketing uh, uh, advertising program, and no one saw the movie, and they ripped it from theaters like on its second weekend. And then there, and everyone's like, "Well, you know, this movie did so badly in the box office. Of course, we're not going to release it anywhere else." Like, well, yeah, because. No one knew it existed. <laughs> yeah. And and that is something worth acknowledging, that box office success is not indicative of quality. As we've seen, there have been a lot of terrible films that have made a shitload of money and a lot of good films that have just gone by almost completely unseen. And a lot of it ultimately just comes down to like how the studio decides to handle their, their marketing and their push. And if they just decide not to do it, they won't. And they didn't. Anyways, uh, <laughs> moving along from that. So, the, I mean, the real big thing that happened this weekend, though, was... Uh, Tenet is now, or Tenet or Tenet? Tenet. Tenet. Uh, Tenet. Palindrome, the movie, is now out in theaters. Also, it still bothers me to this day that the word palindrome is not in of itself a palindrome. What would you What would you name them? Oh, I don't I don't know. It would have to be a completely Think different. Think about it on the spot right now. What would you name them? <laughs> I'm not that creative. At this exact moment. <laughs> I'm just saying that it should be a palindrome. It should. It's a missed opportunity. It makes me angry. But anyways, Tenet came out. Um primarily internationally um a few theaters in the u.s but i mean it's doing decently well so far so i think it's poised that looks like across 100 million internationally which is low by any other standards but i think pretty good considering the circumstances Mm -hmm. Mm. it is it is officially at trolls 2 level (laughs) wait trolls but trolls 2 trolls world world tour trolls but that that was the one that came out on streaming right yes so was that its first weekend that it got hit 100 million or was that okay all right well it's on par with trolls but the impressive thing is well i actually don't know i'm not sure which one of those is more impressive that (laughs) trolls hit 100 million on pure vod or that tenet hit 100 million despite being in a fraction of its normal markets yeah i don't know they're both really interesting at the end of the day um uh, i've heard mix the positive things about this same yeah it's not one that i'm 
going to take the risk to go see. Like someone asked me, it's like, what are you going to do about Tanette? And I'm like, nah. Like, I do want to see it eventually because I'm curious about it. But I also make a fucking palindrome joke again. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do about it. <laughs> what, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Sit and cry because I can't come <laughs> up with one. But I, I find a lot of Nolan's movies, especially his more recent work, to be really unlovable. Like, they're, they're impressive. You watch them and go, okay, I can appreciate the filmmaking here. Visually, it's stunning. It's maybe some interesting storytelling. But I just, I can't love them. And this is not a movie that I'm, like, itching to go see. Now, fuck, when Bond comes out, I'm screwed. <laughs> I, I can't not. Right. I cannot live in a world where James Bond is in theaters and I haven't seen it. That's totally fair. Um, so I might literally go to my grave just to see this movie. <laughs> uh, so Kerry Fukunaga, I hope you did a good job because it might kill me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Do you have any interest in seeing Tanet? Not really. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like we've both been pretty lukewarm on this since it's been announced. I don't yeah. remember us ever being like jumping out of our seats, being like, holy shit, a new Nolan film. No, I mean, look, I appreciate his craft. I appreciate that he is undeniably one of the, I'd say, what, probably top five directors working right now. And he's one of the few people that can put an original film out at a blockbuster level and make that kind of money. And I, I can appreciate all of those things. Um, but the movies just don't resonate right? most of the time. So I, I hope I get a chance to see this, preferably in IMAX, but I'll even settle for a theater down the line. But if I don't, Ah, whatever. I'll, you know, I'll watch it on my iPad just the way he intended. Yes. So, uh, all right. So there's not a lot of other real news. We'll get to Milan. I think we'll, we'll have a lengthy discussion of Mulan as part of our bat plugs because we did watch it this weekend. Um, yeah, we did. In terms of other news, pretty light week. Um, it was announced that, uh, very sadly, both Robert Pattinson and Dwayne Johnson, as well as Dwayne Johnson's family, have all contracted COVID, um, which obviously puts a damper in those movies, but it's also just sad in general mm -hmm. um you know it, it just sucks was was <laughs> i don't know what Dwayne's else to say about it from i feel so weird just calling him Dwayne. was the rocks from from set or was it from is it been announced uh, how he how i i don't know okay. um all i saw was it is it was him and his family um but in typical rock fashion he definitely handled it in a very tongue-in-cheek manner because mm -hmm. he put in an update recently and said that you know the most important thing is he once again can smell what the rock is cooking that's good that's very good god damn it, i do love him he's just so fucking charming mm -hmm. so but obviously hoping for a, a speedy recovery for for both of them and obviously hope that um you know if it did happen on set that there weren't more people that were affected because i mean there's I, I don't know there's there's so many levels of this just being shitty like it's it's shitty that a person has gotten sick it is shitty that these movies have gotten shut down both for you know us who want to see them eventually but you know especially for the cast and crew who you know a lot of those guys aren't going to continue to get paid necessarily while this is happening um you know and there's a, a whole separate conversation we had about whether stuff should be starting back up or not but at the end of the day it's like those are very, very complicated decisions that we are the two guys in a podcast. Yeah, we, can't we really have change nowhere near enough context to know what goes into making those sort of decisions. We just hope that when it happens, it happens safely and responsibly and, and you know, hope that everyone recovers quickly. So um, but I have one last little piece of news, Cameron, oh. which is so we didn't, we didn't talk about this. What? So we haven't rehearsed this. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, we do a pre-rehearsal. It takes us five hours to record every episode. We do the whole thing once. Yes. Every every bit is planned out. Yes. Which I just, know they feel natural. If you thought we were bad at improv, no, we're actually just really bad writers. <laughs> so, But no, uh, it was announced this week who is going to star in the Jack Reacher Amazon series. So I don't think you care at all about Jack Reacher. No, this was formerly uh, Jim, John not Katzenberg. <laughs> no, no. So you're thinking you're thinking Cause of Jack the, Ryan. I'm thinking Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan, which is the Tom Clancy property. No. Yes. Um, Jack Reacher was Chris Pine. No, that was also Jack <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> it's hard to Tom get our, our Jacks straight. Yes. yes. Tom Cruise played Jack Reacher in two films. Yes, um, people made fun of him because Jack Reacher is supposed to be super tall. Yeah, Jack Reacher, the character, is like 
Arnold Schwarzenegger size, like yes. at his peak, like six foot five, huge, like a, a, a mountain of a man. So everyone's like, why is Tom Cruise, this who's four foot this, four, yeah, <laughs> four foot four on top of an apple box? Yes. How is he doing this? And look, I have I saw the first movie and it's that one was made by Christopher McQuarrie um, and in McHugh we trust. He always does really good stuff, especially with Tom Cruise, actually. I really like that first movie. I think it's it's quite excellent. And yeah, it's not maybe the character everyone knew. And I only read one of the books afterwards. And it, it was fine. It's it's a fun like entertainment, like a summer read, if you will, like a poolside read. But what I will say about Tom Cruise is he can get shit made. So yes. I think that first movie is really good. Is that the news that it's Tom Cruise again? Tom Cruise <laughs> again. Yeah, Tom Cruise is making a transition to TV. No. Um, no, they picked an actor who is a little bit more... Um, fit for the role, but I, I will still go on record as saying that I, I actually like Tom Cruise in those movies. Um, okay. But this might actually get you to care about Jack Reacher, which is that Alan Richson is going to play him. Oh, fuck yes. <laughs> See? I'm in. I knew this would get you. I had you. a whole bit prepped of like just throwing <laughs> names out, and I would have never gotten to Alan... Uh, this, never gotten to him. This is maybe like one of the few names that could actually get you to start watching this. Like I, I would have been inter- interested regardless, but I'm definitely going to watch this now. So for those of you who don't know, Alan Richson um, is Hawk on Titans, but we both know him <laughs> from his days on Blue Mountain Stage. Yes. It's the great Thad Castle. Thad Castle. <laughs> and of course, he was also Aquaman back in the Smallville no days. Cares. Just Thad Castle. <laughs> Just Thad Castle. <laughs> but look, I... I love Alan Richson. Uh, we stand. He also performed on American Idol. <laughs> he did? Yeah, back in like season four. Like, I think while he was already filming in Smallville, okay. he auditioned for American Idol just to flirt with Paula. God damn it. I love him so much. Yes. And I, uh. he even, I think he made it through to Hollywood before they're like, you, you can't. <laughs> you can't on this say, show he made it that no, he far has a, he has a good voice oh he does have a good yeah, voice but oh, no, okay. i think the producer's like no you can't be here <laughs> he made it there just on charisma alone he did but, uh, look I, we both love him so much i mean he he's great in everything he's in i i'm trying to decide whether i want to bother watching even doom patrol season two there's no in hell i'm ever watching titans any more of it um but you know he's solid in that he does have like good acting chops too and like i mean he's incredibly funny on blue mountain state yeah um i feel like that's a show that probably does not hold up well at no. all <laughs> no at, <laughs> at all but i will say that like that character he plays is such a like farcical exaggeration the like that element alone maybe might still hold up but regardless he he's i think super talented incredibly charming I think this is great. I think this is perfect casting. He's also six foot two, so he actually looks like the character is supposed to look like. Yes. Um, and I'm just excited. Like this is probably going to be a pretty big show. Like, and it's his first time really leading something. And for I that know, that's alone, awesome. I'm really really happy for him because I think he's a guy that can go places. So I'm I'm super excited about this. So hopefully this show comes out pretty soon. Um, but unless you have a surprise bit of news for me, we can finally move on. Uh, no. Nope. You didn't write one out when we did our pre-run <laughs> on this? Okay. Uh, but uh, we're starting out Justice League with the uh, the pilot, the three-episode pilot, Secret Origin. Right off the bat, Cameron, I have to ask you, are you most excited about watching Justice League because every single episode, save one, is at least a two-parter? I am. Absolutely. <laughs> I, and I, th- we, I think we brought this up uh, before, I don't have great memory of Justice League. Oh, really? I, I, I always prefer JLU. I don't think we have talked about this, actually. Yes. I I never... So I never watched it live. Okay. And so I could only watch it through syndication. Child. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'll use my useful, youthful energy to carry this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I only watch it through syndication. And so most of the time, I, I could only watch one part at a time. So the show never made sense to me. Oh, okay. That My would... own two-part fantasy... <laughs> Is that where this comes from? <laughs> is that where your whole obsession two parters come from? Was being only shown single parts of shows when you were yeah, a kid? Yeah, it's like wow, this would be so much better as a two parter. <laughs> it all makes sense now. Yeah. Um, so you, do you then watch Justice League Unlimited live? Uh, I don't think live. Did you watch any of this live? Not really. I, mean, I, I watched Static live, but okay. Justice League was wasn't a kids TV show. No, it was on Cartoon Network. Exactly. But you watched other shit on Cartoon Network. I did. So how did you miss Justice League? Because I think there, was it a Saturday night ever Friday night? I don't know. So to, to so keep in mind, everyone, this show came out in 2004. 
Yes. Um, so I did watch it live because I would have been what, 14, 15 when it came out. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Oh, wait, no, this, this came earlier. Out, this came out yeah. in 2001. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know why I thought 2004. So 2001. So, oh, yes, yeah, so I was 12 when this came out. Um, I did watch this live. And I, I watched pretty much all of Just League and Just League Unlimited live when it came out. Um, now, mind you, because it was 2001, I didn't watch it when it aired. I TiVo'd that shit. Hell yeah. And I would watch it on Saturday morning. <laughs> there, There's a, a TikTok that, that's kind of blown up recently. Oh, my God. Uh, you are a child. I am. About a uh, someone found one of their old VHSs of, of live recording mm-hmm. stuff. And it's... It's only for me. You wouldn't care about this. But it was the premiere of High School Musical 2, which led into... It was the, a three-hour uh, tape. So it was yeah. the High School Musical 2 premiere, which led into the Phineas and Ferb premiere. Oh, damn. Which led into the episode of Hannah Montana where the Jonas Brothers had their first TV appearance. That is a pretty historically significant block of time. Yeah. And so seeing this video, I'm like, I remember recording so much on VHS back in the day. Oh, you did? I'm very curious if my mom still has any of those. I'm kind of surprised you would have been old enough to still record stuff so on VHS. So at, at that point, uh, it was when my, my mom and stepdad first started dating. Mm-hmm. And so we would go to his place a lot. Okay. Uh, and I desperately needed TV all the time, content. Yes. yes. And so I would record the previous night's shows and not watch them. Ah. And then I'd go to his place and we had a, t- a TV in my room set up. Okay. And I would play the VHS of the previous night's shows. I Like, this actually I find very touching that you had that memory. Yes. Because I, I just assume that you're too young for everything. <laughs> Even though you're not that much younger than me. Like two years. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like two years. Those two years make a difference. <laughs> right now, Cameron, they do I... these micro generations. Yes. They're getting smaller and smaller. Right now, I'm in my 30s and you're not. So yes. you're a child to me. <laughs> but like I remember having to set the like VCR to record. Mm-hmm. Like I remember doing this for Batman Beyond. Like I actually oh, yeah. remember like seeing in like comics at the time. Really, the advertisements for Batman Beyond knowing it was going to premiere, um, setting it to record like on a VCR, but also knowing that I wasn't going to be at the house at the time. Like we were going to my grandparents and mind you, my grandparents live like 15 minutes away, but we were still going to my grandparents. So yeah. I, not only did I record it, but then I watched it live at their place and then I had it on VHS there when I got go. back. <laughs> I'm sure that tape is long, long gone. Um, but all this is to say that I remember secret origins <laughs> when okay. it came out. Um, and I felt like it mostly held up. Now, when did you, so you watch this on syndication? You've seen this three parter in its entirety before, I take it. Yes, but it's probably been a decade since <clears> I've <throat> seen most of these episodes. Yeah, same. It's it's been quite a while. Um, but I don't know, like for you, just before we kind of get into the details of the episode, like did it hold up for you? Oh, absolutely. Mm. This this is the storytelling we've been waiting for. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the character intros were interesting because obviously we've seen Superman, Batman, Flash. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have seen Green Lantern, but the show has would not have seen Green Lantern yet. This this Green Lantern, John. Stewart oh, Green okay, Lantern. right. We yeah. saw Kyle Rayner. Yeah. Uh, um, and even now, it's like they make reference to John having like an established career as Green Lantern, but we really don't know much about what that career looked like prior to joining right. the Justice and, League. Same with Hot Girl. They, yeah. they set both of them up as established heroes. Right. And then they introduce Wonder Woman and Martian Manhunter over the course of the episode. Yes. I have a lot of problems with Green Lantern right now. As okay. We see him. <laughs> because this is his job. He should have been on top of this. Years ago, he should have been the one. This man. is literally his job as a Green Lantern is to make sure his sector, which includes Mars, doesn't have invaders like this. OK, but so, OK, so we, we should set up a little bit of context here. I mean, literally his job. OK, <laughs> that is the one responsibility. I, of Green I have a response to that. But so for the little bit of context here, I mean, th- this episode overall pretty thin on plot. The basic idea is that, you know, Earth's heroes 
um, have to unite to defeat a seemingly unstoppable alien invasion uh, by the Imperium. Yes, this... not the White Martians, as I had written down many times. About right, those. yeah, they are heavily inspired by the White Martians, um, but they're uh, a, like a ruthless, parasitic species that once wiped out all the Martians and now has their collective eyes set on Earth to take it over and capture all of its resources. Um, so yeah, like the the prologue of this show sets up that the you know there is some sort of vault that is un like unearthed um by a couple astronauts on mars Quick. not john carter but oh did you see that both the characters names were inspired by john carter oh was the first guy john no so oh. the uh i know he was j something car like j he's j allen carter. Alan carter. Alan carter yes exactly so that's obviously named after john carter of mars and then uh, the other astronaut was Ed Reese, which is supposed to be um, Edgar Rice Burroughs, the writer of John Carter of uh, Mars. It's a reference yeah. to that. Gotcha. So they did get their John Carter on there, um, which I honestly didn't get initially. It wasn't until I was writing down the notes, John Car- like Jay Carter on Mars, I'm like, oh, hey, I wonder if that's a reference to John Carter of Mars. <laughs> sure shit it is. But they open up uh, a vault, which then unleashes the, these aliens out in, back into the universe. So... And we eventually learn from Martian Manhunter that the backstory there is that it was like, I think, what, well over a century ago? It was a thousand years ago, and it was a 500-year war. Right, yeah. And I I think, so eventually, the the native Martians, the green Martians um, that Martian Manhunter is one of, they eventually use a nerve gas to, like, basically paralyze the Imperium and then john jones the last remaining martian locked them away in a vault but i couldn't quite remember the timeline as to when he did that but it would have been lo- 500 years ago okay so it would have been long enough ago that john stewart wasn't around but the guardians are immortal beings they've been around since the beginning of the universe yes but as we'll find out next week and it wasn't always the green lanterns it was the, the man hunters, hunters for a while right. so we don't know what the status but that was well before a thousand years ago <laughs> but look we don't know what the timeline of all of this is uh maddie maybe you can help us with this maybe you figure this out but maybe it's totally possible that the imperium invasion happened in the period between when the man hunters were slight spoiler here like um like decommissioned and when the Green Lantern Corps was in its full effect. Maybe they didn't yet have a Green Lantern in Sector 2814. Here's, here's, here's how I will write it for myself. <laughs> this is your head headcanon? Yes. <laughs> Dealing with the Illyrium, is that what they're called? Imperium. Imperium was Guy Gardner's responsibility. And he just forgot. <laughs> As they first landed on Earth, he's like in his bed flipping through a magazine. He just goes, oh shit, I was supposed to do that. <laughs> Well, you know how he was spending his time is he was going through his kitchen cabinet trying to find which bowl was best to give himself a haircut. Yes. So. But yeah, I mean, we don't know what Green Lantern or Hot Girl were kind of up to before this. And and I think they were trying to maybe save themselves a little bit of time and only having two character origins in this. Oh, because they, they like Hot Girl was super on the back burner for all this episode. Yeah. And. I, I would say that they did a pretty good job either reintroducing us to characters or introducing us to characters for the first time, with the exception of Hot Girl. And yes. I feel like Hot Girl doesn't even really get interesting and get a lot to do until the finale of Justice League, and then she gets some really good story arcs in Justice League Unlimited. Yes. Um, I think she's the most underserved character for the rest of the show, and you see that here. But otherwise, I, I thought they did a pretty good job of doing a quick reminder of, like, who all these people were in a way that if you were watching, say, this for the first time and hadn't watched Beatoff Superman, you got a good sense of who these characters were. I agree. You know, it's like, you know, Batman is the, you know, the the silent brooding detective trying to figure out why all the deep space uh, monitoring stations have gone under. He is reluctant to team up with Superman, even though they clearly have a, a camaraderie of sorts. Um, and even the way they introduce Superman, it's like him showing up at um, seemingly like the um, United Nations, essentially, to do this massive plan of nuclear disarmament, which is basically just the plot of Superman for the quest for peace done once again. There's four of those movies? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, um, no, I mean, they, they, you know, they do a good job setting up where Superman comes from. Um, and, like, how did you feel about how they handled the introduction of Wonder Woman and Martian Manhunter? Because those are the two characters to get an actual origin here. Uh, John Jones I liked. I 
was kind of shocked with how they set up Wonder Woman because I'm not oh, used really? to her being the outsider. Like that, she has a she's very Starfire right now, kind of the one that doesn't understand a lot of culture. Mm-hmm. Is you know super strong. Yeah, one of the most strong members of the team. Uh, but you know her being the the question mark for everything is so. You mean it, the like the kind of the fish out of water character? Yeah, because especially you know. Thinking about her in JLU, mm-hmm. she's always the one that knows everything. Yeah, you know she she's right by Batman's side, and Batman is specifically the one that knows everything. Yeah, and she's the one that's like correcting him on things. But I, I see, I, I get where you're coming from, but I actually like that they took that mm-hmm. approach. Like, I I didn't I'm, I don't dislike it. Mm-hmm. I was just kind of taken aback. Okay, yeah. I, like, I mean, oh right, she is not in society yet. That's fair. Yeah, and obviously in the the Wonder Woman theatrical movie in, in Gal Gadot's movie we saw her do a little bit of the fish out of water thing mm-hmm. but she never she still comes off as so strong and confident in that movie and I, I will give you that this show plays her naivete a little bit stronger than we've seen other more modern iterations do and I think it's also because there was one line that I'm just like where are you coming from right now where they're like breaking off into teams mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh GL is like, I don't want to be with the rookie. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Excuse you. <laughs> but the like, thing yeah, how can get away with this? But John, I expect more from you. But the thing you have to remember is John Stewart is the Justice League's dad. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like and he he is a military background. Like this is a precise man. Have you seen that haircut? Yes. And the the very the the slight uh, Mr. Fantastic, yeah, gray, gray sweeps. Yeah, man, that that he is all about precision, and this is high stakes situation. He does not want to get paired with the rookie. I get where he's coming so from. So instead, he gets paired with the Flash. <laughs> yes, which is super fun. <laughs> which is even worse than rookie. <laughs> even better. But no, I I I liked that they kind of set her up as this um, kind of like naive outsider character. Like we, her hit like origin is done really really quickly. It's basically like three scenes. It's like her on the beach of Themyscira with her mom worried about the this coming war they can sense um and then it's her stealing the the armor and the tiara and the lasso of truth from paradise island and then basically just showing up to help all done very very quickly and and we're pretty soon gonna get more on her when she goes back to themiscira um but what i thought was really interesting was that uh, susan eisenberg who voices wonder woman and, and worth acknowledging right off the bat that this voice cast is exemplary is, is peak yeah th- this is absolutely peak voice cast and susan eisenberg is uh, amazing and just like everyone else will always be like my wonder woman and i like that she plays the character very young here in a way that i didn't remember when i watched it um but like she sounds young and in a really effective way of portraying that sort of um like naive youthful energy and exuberance Mm -hmm. Which is really fun. Um, and I do love that she shows up and then it's like just a total fucking badass. Like everyone's a little bit skeptical of her, including Batman. He's like, wait, let's see what she can do. I, I did really like that. <laughs> yeah. And then she just goes in like a lasso as a, a walker and smashes it around the city. If, I was going to say, if there was a, a single thing I could tweak, because the, these episodes are, are, are very, very good. And I don't have a lot of like yeah. what ifs like I did with. Every other show. Could you, do you think maybe you could stretch it out to a fourth part though? Can you? Oh, <laughs> could I? <laughs> Can you pad this shit out? I definitely could. But I, I'm just, I'm so glad that these characters are here. Like I, I'm, I didn't realize how much I missed them until they showed up. Um, and like as much as I love them, I think the MVP here, it's gotta be the flash, right? Okay. Like not in terms of like actual heroics, but in terms of like characterization and like stealing the show. Oh yeah. I mean, Michael Rosenbaum as a Flash is still one of the best voice acting casting choices ever made, I would say. And I, there was definitely a period of time when he could have played that character in live action and would have been amazing. And I'll, seeing this Flash, because like I said, I haven't watched this in a while, it makes me appreciate Wally West and Young Justice so much more. Oh, okay, he's yeah. He's doing everything to just be this guy. Yeah, and like we we kind of see in later seasons, and as he as he matures, he's not like he no. is a very sympathetic and emotional guy, mm-hmm. but he wants the face of Barry, 
He, yeah. he wants that persona. So he goes out of his way to be this overactive flirt who has to make the joke every time. Right. Yeah, and it and it's interesting here because I don't I don't think a Barry Allen exists in I don't think I think any other flashes exist in the DCAU, right? And there's a flash museum we eventually see. Is this see. not Barry? No, this is Wally West. Oh. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Oh yeah, oh. no, this is Wally. Okay. Yeah, that's why I thought you were like that's why it reminds you of Wally. From... Oh no, no, no. I thought this was yeah. Barry. No, we there we didn't get an answer that it was Wally until uh Starcrossed, which is gonna be the finale of Justice League. Okay. And that's when it's finally revealed that it is in fact Wally West. But yeah, it's 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 Wally. So I don't yeah, I don't know if another flash exists, and by all means, like Maddie, uh James, watch our database. As always, please let us know when we're we're wrong, which we always are. But I'm pretty sure he's the first one. And what I liked about him here is that even in his very first introduction, because he's the, he's the only other returning character from previously in the DCU, and obviously we know Batman Superman very well, and they do a good job just reminding us kind of what these guys stand for. Mm-hmm. But the first time we see the Flash in this, it's just him being interviewed on the news, and him feeling like Superman is just like being too much of a big Boy Scout, and he's like, oh, I really don't care. I'm the fastest man alive, and I can't be any like everywhere at once. And just, I love that they played that moment to show, one, what his powers are, and two, that his just general kind of indifference um it's a playful indifference like i think he cares but he's also just like whatever like i'm just gonna do my thing he's gonna help out where he can yeah um but even when he he shows up later on he's like wait why am i here what is going on i just like was called telepathically by marsh manager to show up here exactly (laughs) But wait, so you, you said you had some issues, though, with how they handled GL. Is it just that he didn't save the universe and his sector from the, the Imperium invasion when he couldn't possibly have? Or was it other A little things? bit. A little bit. I mean, and, and also, and you, you did kind of uh, quell it by saying, like, he is the military guy. He is the dad. I quelmed it? Yes, I feel quelmed. <laughs> is that, okay. Is that not a thing? Is that a thing? I think it's a thing. I don't think that's a thing. I'm going to use it as a thing. Mm. Mm. I feel satisfied in your answer in saying that he is the he has the military background. So to quelm means what? To like put at ease, right? I just I love I looked up quelm on Google. Is quelm a scrabble word? No, quelm is not in the scrabble <laughs> dictionary. Quelm Quelm isn't a word, Cameron. <laughs> but it sounds like a word. It's been made up. By whom? I don't know. It's probably just... the Simpsons. Yes. It's probably a fucking I mean... Simpsons bit that's been lodged in my brain. I think you're combining like qualm and calm. And whelmed. And whelmed. Yeah, you're just making yeah. <laughs> you went from <laughs> whelmed and whelm isn't even a word, mind you. You said whelmed. I never said whelmed. Underwhelmed is a word, and over like underwhelmed and overwhelmed. Yes, but that's that's the that's the, that was the young justice joke. Yeah, but whelm isn't a word itself. So I know, but that so was the joke I was you, trying to make. You created a fake word quelm <laughs> off of the other fake word whelm. Yes. Now the real question, Cameron, is either of those a palindrome? Yes. <laughs> okay, I quelled. I think was the word you were looking for. Quelled your objections. Yes, I feel at ease by your yes. by your analysis. Yes okay but what i mean you are the big gl person here like how did you feel about um his introduction how he's handling the episode did you do you still wish this was kyle rayner who i believe is still your favorite i do it is he is i i i mean they they obviously had to power and depower certain people certain team members to a certain extent so no one is too overpowered yeah you don't have the the live action justice league situation where the six of them are nothing, and then Superman comes, and now they are something. Right. They are each in their own powerful. Mm-hmm. And for animation's sake, I understand why they did this to GL, but GL has no constructs. He makes circles. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah. Yes. I didn't the think entire about that. episode, he doesn't make anything. <laughs> and that's the whole point of Green Lantern. Like, that's, that's why I love Green Lantern, is the creativity of the character mm-hmm. it's also why i love kyle ranner because he has the most creative brain he's a comic artist right um hey, yeah and john and, stewart's an architect he is yeah uh, but we don't see him make anything that's true he doesn't build any houses no <laughs> and and i'm trying to think like through the rest of what i remember of jl and jlu 
he doesn't build a lot. I think it's it's almost always just beams and circles. Hmm. I never thought about that before. It's a really good point. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can understand. But I mean, I love John Stewart. I oh, love yeah. seeing Green Lantern in here. It, it just makes me so excited. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I get why they chose John Stewart. I mean, one just to add diversity to the the cast, but also to offer a really different POV as well. You kind of imagine if they brought in Kyle Rayner, he would feel a little bit like the Flash. Like I was, I was going to say both Hal and Kyle would yeah. both just just be Flash clones. Exactly. So the nice thing about ha- having Jon Stewart here is like he is the most... Somehow he actually even surpasses Batman as being the most serious of all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think maybe because Batman is always serious, but Batman often will choose to not do something and let situations play out, whereas I feel like Jon is more inclined to... Um, lead into the fray and jump in and make very decisive action yes but he's he's fantastic and also it gives us a chance to spend more time with phil lamar which mm-hmm. is always always worth it yeah I, I would say he's one that as you said he'll he'll jump in and deal with the consequences whereas batman would just rather not have consequences at all yeah that's true batman will like preemptively try and stop something from happening and he'll obviously take action as well um but he is much more um analytical yes and uh methodical in its approach but i, I mean i i love john stewart and and obviously he's not given a whole hell of a lot to do here um you know i'd say a lot of these episodes hang on batman one because he's the character everyone knows the most and he's kind of leading this this investigation but a lot of it ends up hanging on martian manhunter too and for me this show was my first introduction to that character same and this show made me really love that character especially like, I do, I do love that they have to, you talk about depowering, they really have to depower Jean in this show. Yeah, I mean, he, he goes down with every hit. Yeah. Because <laughs> he is so overpowered. So, for those of you who are not super familiar with all of the Martian Manhunter's powers, so, uh, most notably, he's a shapeshifter, mm-hmm. um, an ability that the Imperium steal um, to use their own benefit. But so he's a he's a shapeshifter, flight. He can go intangible. He's a telepath. Um, he's super strong. Can fly. Yes, can fly. Most versions he has um, increased invulnerability. He's not, he's not quite on the same level as Superman. Um, but in this version, every time he's hit with a laser blast, he goes down and he goes down hard. Yeah, and he's out. <laughs> yeah, and it happens to him like. At least once in each of the parts of the series or in this episode yes. collection here, um, which like I get the need to do that in the same way that Superman, you know, we even see him get electrocuted at one point in this these episodes because mm-hmm. he has to be you, you like you have to find a way to like take out your heroes. Right. Um, but I feel like we we it takes him a long time for us to really see just like how insanely powerful Martian Manhunter well, can normally be. Normally his only weakness is fire. Yeah. Which. I, f- I think they eventually touch on that. Um, but I don't remember them either playing that up a lot here, too. Because mm-hmm. um, let's be honest, it is kind of silly. It is. I mean, no more silly than... So I, I was reading uh, the notes on these episodes, mm-hmm. and someone was saying, like, oh, well, the reason that Green Lantern couldn't make a, a sphere to block the gas is because the gas was yellow. Oh, and yeah. And I'm like, fuck you, and this yellow <laughs> bullshit... Yellow is a construct of fear. It's not the color yellow. That's a joke in, in a single Batman comic. But no, like I, I like they included Martian Manhunter here. I like how they portray him. Um, I, you know, I thought it was interesting too that he is when he shows up on Earth, he's like captured and like squirreled away by the military. Now it's a little bit unclear if it was the U.S. military that captured him and hid him away, or if at that point they'd already been taken over by the Imperium. It wasn't quite clear it, it seemed like they'd already been uh, taken by the imperium i think so yeah because like that is the advantage the imperium has is they've stolen the shape-shifting powers of the the native martians and they initially replaced um j allen carter when he was on mars and he was the lead um like covert operative who's helped slowly bring over well, more he, he and more. then worked his way to being a senator exactly yeah which shows how easy it is to get into politics right <laughs> 
Well, and as being a sen- like part of his senatorial work was that he went on this massive um, disarmament campaign that he put Superman at the forefront of, which was mm-hmm. a, a very crafty way of making the Earth more vulnerable to invasion. Um, so I, I think this is a, a really fantastic plot in order to justify uniting all these characters. Um, and I feel like the stakes only seemed a little bit soft because we're going to see another invasion happen at the end of the series. But um, for reasons we'll get into when we get to that episode, the emotional stakes are really high there too. And I would say that the, um, like the, the planetary scope of those stakes are also a little bit higher. Yeah. And I think that series of episodes overall handles the same concept a little bit better. But that being said, this is an excellent way to justify uniting all these characters together and introducing all of them. I mean, so much so that, fuck, the Avengers did it, and they did a really good job with it. Justice League tried to do it. It did a really terrible job with it. Yes. I, 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 what I really appreciated about this is there, the, the backbone wasn't the mindless horde. Not the backbone. The, the mindless horde didn't play as big of a role as you would see in most other films and group team ups like you mean in terms of the team mostly just battling cannon fodder or i'm not quite sure what you mean well i mean just the like the, the the there were other you know the the mindless minions weren't the main threat the main threat was these giant oh. machines and it was the mystery of how what are they doing here how do we get them all okay i, I see what you mean yeah because right so the because the imperium they have uh foot soldiers who a lot of them have been disguised as humans for a while they have these uh tripod walkers which are clearly inspired from hg wells's uh war of the worlds thank you my god how did i blank on that yeah so clearly inspired by uh, as you said war of the worlds and then on top of that they have uh what, what i remember as being terraform machines but they're actually just basically giant smokestacks to uh, block out the sun because the uh, imperium are all nocturnal mm-hmm. um which then gives a really really convenient way to then kill all the aliens later on <laughs> yes oh man part three <laughs> had some of the grossest animation of the DCAU. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was so visibly uncomfortable when the Imperium was like dissecting uh, John, John Jones. Yeah, because the, just the standard foot soldiers are these kind of um, asymmetrical, uh, almost kind of, they, they look kind of look like they could have almost come from some of the Batman Beyond aesthetic a little bit, with, like mm-hmm. the, the big bright red eye. Oh, yeah, I was going to say they're, they're very like um microscopic based yeah like they they look like giant cells exactly yeah um so they have those yeah, osmosis jones if we want to go to <laughs> yes obviously the most relevant of references osmosis jones yes but they did you ever watch the show ozzy and drix oh uh, did i watch the show ozzy it and was drix? so good the theme song was great it was I, we have to get into the theme song <laughs> at, at when we get to the end because yes oh man do i have things to say about these 3d models oh yeah well yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk, uh, tackle the uh, the intro at the end, I guess. Yes. Um, but, oh, like, you know, and the design is great of, like, the, the walkers. And then we eventually learn that um, the the Imperium is actually, like, this like this sort of queen, like, head leadership thing that sort of, like, drives the rest of the, the, the hive mind. Um, and, and obviously the... The the Imperium drones have sentience. I mean, my God, they they were sleeper agents for years, including you know uh, Senator Carter, who was a uh, critical in the whole thing happening. But yeah, the Imperium is this like very much even more so a cell. Like, there's nothing really vaguely um, humanistic about it. It's just this this massive. It's almost like a mushroom, like this translucent mushroom with these tentacles. And when it captures Jean, to your point, yeah, like it, it like pushes the tentacles underneath his skin. Mm, I it's hate like. It. It's it's kind of like in uh, the Brendan Fraser mummy, the scare beetles, like they're scurrying yeah. around under the skin, but like even more grotesque because like to the point of the, the tentacles have ridges and lines along them. And when the tentacles go through the skin, it's not like the skin just bulges out. You can like see the texture of the tentacles underneath the skin. It's really visceral. I'm so uncomfortable just talking about it again. Yeah. And it, I was surprised by how dark that was actually and and i mean credit to the the creatives and the artists for finding a way to like really give that sense of dread and um making it seem like really grotesque and creepy while still being like quote unquote kid friendly um it was clever but it, it is really really disturbing mm-hmm. to see 
And I, I think, again, it, it kind of goes back to what we've been saying since BTOS. As long as it's not human, they can do whatever the fuck they want to these yeah, characters. that's absolutely true. I mean... Because like, you couldn't get away with doing that to Batman or Superman. No, no, you really can't. Yeah, they, they can get away with torturing Martian Manhunter because it's Martian Manhunter. Um, and it's kind of interesting, too, because... They, to your point about them being able to like kind of do whatever they want to non humans, I mean, a lot of the, the Imperium drones are also like dispatched in pretty violent ways. Yeah. Like oh, you, you see them like bubbling alive when, yeah. when they first get hit by the sun. It's, it's pretty grotesque. And, you know, even the, the walkers, like they don't look like machines. It's kind of implied that they're some sort of like organic machines. But you also get the sense that there is maybe some level of sentience there and the fact that the justice league dispatches them so violently and aggressively and destructively like i was surprised by how put off i was actually by that a little bit that i i get why this alien race like their aesthetic is much more organic um but that ambiguity as to like how sentient they were i was like oh that's that's kind of off-putting a little bit because i feel like even in superman when he was fighting um like the uh, like the parademons and stuff. I don't. I feel like it was. They were never quite that destructive. I think they were just always dispatched off screen. Like you just throw yeah. them off screen. And and there's also a history of just like, oh, it's an animal, so it's okay. We can just kill it. Yeah. Yeah. Except for <laughs> our animals. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> no human animals, but all the alien animals, you could just be the shit out of just mm-hmm. fine. So I, I have two questions. One, I I have an answer for. Okay. I'm curious your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, one. Senator John Carter. J. Allen Carter. J. Allen Carter. Yes. Has been an alien this whole time. Yes. For two years he was on Earth. Mm-hmm. How did he avoid the sun for two years? As a senator. As someone who has to make like press releases and, and make public appearances. It is a very, very good question. Because <laughs> then part two of that question is, in the 500 years of war, how did the Martians not realize that was there? weakness was sun was was uv light yeah uh, okay the real answer is they didn't think it through <laughs> clearly right. i look you could maybe postulate that their aversion to sunlight came as a consequence of being um like hit with the nerve gas and imprisoned that entire time mm-hmm. um that like in the same way that pale skin burns much easier than darker skin like it, it could be something along those same lines too that they're just not used to being around sunlight and so it affects them more now than maybe it did in the past um and before they were like super bronzed amoeba cells yeah exactly oh <laughs> glistening golden um maybe something along those lines maybe it has to do with the difference between the atmospheres although it's unclear if mars ever had an atmosphere when all this my, happened. my argument was mars the the uv light wasn't strong enough on mars yeah i it, think it's too far like i this, think earth is right in that sweet spot where it, it's just harmful enough yeah and i think that could make sense and, and maybe it's possible too that they know how to um protect themselves against ultraviolet light when needed like maybe it's uh it's not something they can do for everybody, but if they need to, they can find a way to like temporarily make that possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so all the superior agents can work. Like maybe it's a thing like, Oh, like, or maybe it's even like, uh, subspecies within the thing. Like, Oh, these ones can't like the the most of the drones can't like maybe even some of them have greater like mental acuity and sentience than other ones. And so that's part of the difference that it makes. Yeah. So I I guess you could like you could invent a reason, but you're right. It doesn't necessarily. I was going to say they should all just they should all not be in America. They should all be in like Oslo (laughs) (laughs) where it's where it's dark, you know, where their winters are dark. Well, like 17 hours a day. They decided to invade in Alaska (laughs) in the winter. (laughs) Yeah. Have to fight the vampires for territory, though. Mm -hmm. Look, it's not they're not flawless episodes, right? Like. You know, one of the things that I didn't even love was that they do like a fake death of Batman um, as like yeah. the, the cliffhanger to the end of the second episode. And you're like, there's no way they kill Batman. Like as an audience, we don't believe that would be the case. And then, you know, the whole thing was that it was, I guess, a, a, a an unspoken plan between Batman and Martian Manhunter to fake Batman's death and then like telepathically disguise him. So we could like, you know, pop up at the last minute to save everyone after they got captured. It, it's just a little bit 
a little bit obvious and a little bit lazy. Okay. I, I, have, I have a question for you around that. Mm-hmm. Um, so when this first came out, it was premiered as a movie, as a TV movie. Uh, I think it's still premiered in three parts, though. Yes, but in the same way that Kim Possible, A Stitch in Time, is three episodes that is always sent out as the movie okay. Stitch in Time. I see what you mean. Like it, When it premiered, all these three episodes were played back to back to back. Yes. Yeah. So at that point, was it premiered as a show or as a TV movie? It premiered as a show. Okay. It, yeah, it premiered as a pilot for the show. Okay, because... then yes, the Batman thing does frustrate me then. Yeah. Because if, if they showed it as like a TV movie and now there's a show, then the death is like, okay, that makes sense because it's like, this is the story. Yeah. They're not just going to kill their biggest superhero their biggest like viewer draw in the very first episode yeah so like to me that was like a a little bit silly and to your point like maybe you know the um the simplicity of just having the alien susceptible to uv light it was, was not the best but it overall works quite well though in terms of finding a way to deliver us all the things we needed to um to make it work um, and the nice thing you see is that it had a lot of good moments. Like, um, one of my absolute favorites is, uh, and very early on, the aliens are just starting to invade and Batman gets a bookcase dropped on him and he's like a little bit injured. Yeah. Uh, and Superman drops him off with a medic. Uh, the medic like goes to like lift up Batman's mask. He just grabs her wrist and is like, don't even think about it. And then even a moment later, when all the action is happening and her back is turned, he just like, not even like standing up. He just like extends his arm off the gurney and fires up a grapple and just zips away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really appreciated that. Just effortlessly cool uh, all the way through, um, even up to the point of the very end when they're forming the Justice League, and he's like, "I'm not a people person, but when you need help, and you will, let me know." Oh, I, I really like because I didn't realize that uh, the Watchtower was funded by Wayne Tech, and <laughs> he said, um, "Superman makes the joke of like, oh, your shareholders must not be happy about this right now." Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, it's it's a line-eyed and hid up, hidden in the aerospace R&D department. And I'm like, this is a trillion-dollar line item. This is maybe the most expensive thing ever built by yeah. humans. <laughs> it is massive. It is filled with weapons. You had to build it in space. Yeah. It ain't cheap to get shit up there. <laughs> like This is not something you can just hide. Yeah. Or like you're super under like paying under the table your accountants yeah and your accounting team do you think at any point batman just asked like superman and gl to help him build it or do you think his ego is too big oh no way he did <laughs> I, I also love the idea that uh the single greatest person on that planet to actually design and build that space station is green lantern yeah because he's an architect that can go to space <laughs> and construct any construction tools he needs um but no, like I, so uh, you know, you get those fun uh, Batman moments in there. Um, I love that they found a way to squeeze in their Independence Day shot uh, of mm-hmm. when the 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 big alien ship is first like showing up and like breaks through the clouds over the city. It's like ah, oh, gotta get that ID four shot in there. Um, no, I loved that. I uh, I think the the one thing that holds this back from being like a great episode or being like the perfect template on which to just mirror a like a live action version of this ultimately it does lack a really good central villain yeah like you think yeah because i was kind of i was waiting for that like end button of yeah. like that it was dark side the whole time yeah you just kind of need a a a solitary figure to kind of hang the whole stakes on a little bit. And, you know, that is something that um, the Avengers in particular was really smart about. Marvel super smart about that. When they went to go do the first Avengers movie, it's like, okay, who should we have be our first villain? Well, luckily for us in the original Avengers comics, the first villain they all went up against was Loki. And also lucky for us, we have the like incomparably charismatic Tom, Tom Hiddleston. Hiddleston. Let's just have him be the villain. Like that was genius. Right. Cause like when you think back in that movie, like, that final battle with them facing off with the drones is incredible. And the rest of the movie is a little bit slow, but it is incredible. But it all works because Loki's been driving us through all the way. Whereas in, you know, in this show, it's basically just the alien drones all the way. Yeah, there's the, the reveal that, oh my God, Senator Carter has been a villain this whole time. But even then, he's not like the main antagonist. It, it kind of ultimately just boils down to the Imperium, who impactful though his, his presence is because of that really grotesque tentacle thing mostly he kind of just comes and goes over yeah. the course of the show. Um, and of course 
most of the Imperium survive. Like, a lot of the ones that are on Earth die, but, like, the big ship still escapes up into the universe, mm-hmm. um, leaving its uh, its the possibility of its return. Oh, man, if only we had this space cop or four <laughs> on Earth whose responsibility is dealing with this shit. If only... I, you know, I don't know. He's he's got other planets in his sector, right? Yeah, but not does he? Nothing happens on those planets. That's true, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I think it just goes to show how fucked up we are. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that's the whole point. Is is most sectors are only supposed to have two Green Lanterns? And we Earth, have we have to have four. Earth has seven now. Oh my God. <laughs> can you can argue that like, oh well, how's you know moved up to the Alpha Lanterns at this point? I'm like, no, but he's still like on earth the majority of the time yeah we, we have a lot of problems we have a lot of, problems. A lot of problems probably because they're not doing their fucking job <laughs> it's mostly their fault uh, i get you got to build a cool house mr architect but you also have 36 <laughs> planets to deal with is it 36 i have no idea oh, okay shouldn't you know that i should mr green lantern i know the sectors wait what do you mean you know the sectors there's 3600 sectors okay so you, yeah. Okay, so you know how many sectors there are. I thought you knew like every sector no, and like no, no, no. who the Green Lanterns is of each sector and the, what planets the, they the, cover. Uh, Sinestro Core is two eighty three. Is there a sector or four eighty three? Cameron, I expected more confidence out of you on this. I know. I'm, You're I'm supposed really to be the ball. our Green Lantern guru. Yes. You know what? You are the most authentic Green Lantern fan you possibly could be because just like Green Lantern, you're not doing your job. Yep. I'll take that. <laughs> uh i mean look at the end of the day these are fun i really i really like these yeah and we as we've been saying for the past four years now this is what everything has been leading up to everything we've been wanting is now in front of us yeah because you know the nice thing too is by broadening out the the dc universe they have this incredible stable of villains to pull from we're going to get a lot of really great villains and we're even going to get some returning of villains that i think are at their most effective in this rocky rocket does Roxy Rocket ever come back? No. I, I love Roxy. She did. I love Roxy Rocket. <laughs> Me too. I love her so much. But you know, it's like I, I think our, you know the appearances we're going to get from from Brainiac, from Darkseid in this are some of the best. Even the the very few Joker appearances in this, I think Rake is some of his his best. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I like I I am incredibly excited excited about this going forward. So I read a little factoid before coming over here, and I tried to find it, but I can't find it online anywhere. But apparently the entirety of the Justice League series was like fully prepped and written out beforehand. So there is a Justice League oh, Bible that exists somewhere. Wow. Okay. That, that's... Like, when they wrote episode one, they had written every idea until mm-hmm. the finale. That is interesting. That that would be worth checking, tracking down. And actually that that makes a lot of sense when you think about how Secret Origin and Starcrossed are are bookends of this whole series yeah I, I was trying to find it but when i googled justice league bible oh god had, oh god <laughs> someone had rewritten the bible with justice league characters uh and w- was it a snyder version of the justice league too i feel like only a snyder Probably. fan would... i mean it, at the beginning it just had like which character which people in the in the bible and it's like first thing is like superman is jesus i'm like all right I, I'm, I'm out yeah uh <laughs> obvious too yeah yeah <laughs> Real a more creative here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone's seen Smallville. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody save me. It's actually pretty damn good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I work on my early 2000s rock voice very often. <laughs> That's what everyone comes back for. Uh, I don't know. I mean, what, any other kind of thoughts on this? Oh, uh, they, they shoehorned in Jason Marsden, which is wonderful. Oh, yes. As, as a it. snapper car. Yes. Because the voice is just a little different than normal Richie, and we're yeah. so like I'm so used to hearing Richie for so long. It took me a minute. I'm like, that's him, right? Yeah. Like that asked. Like, there's no one else that has that nasal. Like that's him. And I'm like, and I had to go. Okay, yes, it is him. Okay. Yeah. Also, I feel like they chose Jason Marsden because the way he says "snapper car." Yeah. Just oh, it's so good. It's oh, it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Uh, but no, oh, very very excited to keep going on with Justice League. Um, all right, so moving on from that, uh, do you want to do our bat plugs real quick, and then we'll wrap things up at the end with some notes from friends? Sure. All right. So mine is uh, DC Bombshells, the uh, the comic series. So I'm continuing my uh, my rapid DC Universe catch up while I can still get access to the library, and I've been wanting to read Bombshells for a really long time, and it's uh, it's good. I'm not gonna say it's great necessarily, but for those of you who don't know what it is, it's the idea that basically all of the, um, the the female heroes and villains that we know in the DCAU 
um, are all working during World War II. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and so it started out actually as a series of like Elseworld statues, and like the statues were like really, really popular. So I remember those. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that was like right when I started buying collectible things. They're gorgeous. Yeah, like the, the designs are super fun and super inventive, and so they're like, well, hey, like these are really popular. Let's go ahead and make a comic series out of it. And you know, from what one could say could possibly be like cynical starts, I actually think it was a pretty great breeding ground for creativity. Mm-hmm. You know, so it features all of them, Supergirl, Wonder Woman, Batwoman, um, you know, and they all have a role to play in kind of uh, World War II, but then also just kind of what's happening in the world around the war itself. Um, you know, and the, and the storytelling's fun. It, go, it definitely goes to some weird places. Um, the artwork is really good through the whole thing. And it's, they do a really clever way of um, kind of like recontextualizing and reinventing um, some of the characters in it, right? So, for example, um, Batwoman uh, started out as playing in major league baseball, right? Cause during world war two, okay. obviously it was women were playing baseball. Mm-hmm. And so like, that's where the idea of like bat woman comes from, right? It's like literally she carries oh, around funny. a bat all the time. Um, but you know, so she's like the bat figure in this. And obviously wonder woman has her, her traditional origin as well. Um, one of my favorite, uh, slight tweaks on the characters is when we meet hot girl, she is like this super awesome inventor and she's basically the rocketeer. Nice. So she has a jetpack and like a, a like a, um, kind of like a hawk themed helmet she wears around. But like all the, all the characters in there. And um, so I read the the first run, which is like a hundred issues. And there's an additional one on called Bombshells United, which is a thirty eight, which I'll get to shortly. But no, I I think it's well worth uh, checking out. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, also, it's just it's filled with lesbians, which I loved. <laughs> like. So like obviously you get like Harley and Ivy and like you know so some of the you know and, and Batwoman's lesbian in that too and she's there with Maggie Sawyer and with Renee Montoya and then they they add some additional ones there too but I was just like I love this it's just a bunch of like badass lesbian superheroes <laughs> it was it was a hundred percent my jam uh, so that's well worth checking out uh, it is all in DC Universe for now so what is your plug so I have a, a very strange plug mm-hmm. per usual uh, it's a YouTube video that I saw and I I would I would. I would like people to have this conversation first, the question they pose before watching the video. Okay. Because the video goes a little overboard with their ideas, but the the question is, what if Digimon beat Pokemon in popularity back in the 90s? How would the world be different? And I see you already... <laughs> drowsing off did, but did did you see all of the shits i could possibly give just escape from my body in a moment's notice? no but it, it's it's an interesting idea because they're very different properties uh, okay wait so I, I actually i basically tuned out before you even finished thinking as soon as you said digimon i tuned out yes, so wait, the, I I, the question is what would have happened if digimon had pokemon's popularity yes how would the world be different <sighs> okay and there there were like a lot of very interesting ideas that they brought up they do go a little overboard in a lot of them but and in its base, a lot of people kind of bundle them together. They are different games, different worlds. Yeah, Pokemon is a collectible game. Digimon was a Tamagotchi for boys. You're not collecting things. You're raising one. You're you're raising one creature. Yeah, and so and in in the Digimon world, everything grows and the story continues. It is a very serialized story compared to Pokemon, which mm-hmm. is a episodic story okay um so you you live in this world now where the most popular thing is a serialized cartoon which kind of opens the doors for more adult series earlier i think their kind of discussion about this is very similar to to avatar okay because avatar was kind of the first serialized animation in america for kids so they were talking about that they were talking about kind of this idea of a marketing stance where you're not trying to collect one of everything and it's not just like an eternal collection, but instead with these since people age and the cast kind of changes in and out from Digimon, everything is kind of a timestamp of a collection. So it's very similar to how Japan does limited releases. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you basically have a six month window where buying something is important. So if I, you know, in comparison, like if I bought a Kim possible lunchbox in 2005, by 2006, the characters have already changed. The look of Kim has changed. The products have completely changed already. So I have to buy a new lunchbox mm-hmm. for this new look of Kim. So more like the uh, the Power Rangers. 
method. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And and Power Rangers would have a stronger foot. I mean, it has a pretty strong footprint now. Yeah. But both owned by Bandai. Mm -hmm. uh, Bandai would basically have a much bigger foothold as opposed to Toei Animation, which is a subset of Bandai. But it, it was it's a very interesting video that I recommend checking out. I didn't realize how much Pokemon like changed culture. I knew it did a lot, but mm -hmm. like a lot of things changed because of Pokemon. It's like how could they have changed again if it was not Pokemon? Yeah. I retract. No, like <laughs> my, it's, it's my... interesting even for people that aren't into either of the franchises. Yes, I, I retract my indifference. Uh, you've, you've quelmed me. Yes, good. <laughs> I look because I, I have no interest in Pokemon or especially Digimon, but I will acknowledge that what is interesting about Pokemon is its cultural impact. Yes. Um, and I, I think it's part of the reason it's been so successful is exactly that it is based around collecting everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And that to your point, like it's not like things go away in phases like, you know, people still give a shit about Charizard. Oh, I mean, fans. Uh, so there are now. Over 860 Pokemon. Um, not to compare it to there's over 2,000 Digimon, but that's a different argument. Uh, but there are fans that will still like boycott games if they don't include every single Pokemon. Yeah. To the level of, like, I feel bad for my niece and nephew that are now just getting into Pokemon, where we only had 150 to worry about. And that was a lot for us. Now they have 860 to worry about. <laughs> Cameron, spoiler alert, they're going to have bigger things to worry about. Nope, <laughs> that's the, the biggest problem of a six-year-old. <laughs> the greatest problem they face is how do they collect them all? Yeah. Uh, and so the, the whole argument kind of hinges on, this is stuff that you're not going to care about, but there was an episode of Pokemon that aired in Japan that caused like 100 kids to have seizures. Yeah, I remember that happening, yeah. Uh, and basically like that was very downplayed because they were still trying to, that was before it even came to America. Mm. And so Toei and Bandai were doing their best to keep this under wraps before it made before they signed the American contract. Uh, and the idea is like, what if this was an actual big deal? It was a big deal. What if we made it a big deal? Yeah. And uh, they didn't even air the cartoon in America. I, look, I, I'm not I'm probably not going to watch the video. Yeah, I fine. feel like if Pokemon didn't exist, I don't think Digimon would have filled that vacuum. That's fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is something about Pokemon in the same way there's something about like Star Wars mm -hmm. where there is no peer to that concept and the effect it had on the world. Like you, you take away Star Wars. I don't think something else quite takes its place and has the exact same impact. But I mean, it, it's certainly an interesting thing to ponder. So. Yeah. And then, you know, there were dozens of Pokemon clones after Yu-Gi-Oh! was Pokemon clone. Yeah. Bakugan, Shaman, Shaman King. Mewtwo, he's a Pokemon clone. He is. Proud of you on that one. I'm very, very proud of you on that. Uh, so the only thing I know about Pokemon. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting conversation, I think, to have between nerds. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all we do here. So. Yes. And it's, it's by Polygon. I don't think I mentioned that. Uh, Polygon did the video. Okay, nice, nice. All right, well, yeah, it will be down in the, the plug. So, uh, and then the last thing we're going to talk about in terms of plugs is Mulan. Yeah. So, finally came out. Um, you took the bullet. I and, did. And, I, I will and... say right up front, please don't buy this movie. Yeah. I, I bought this movie for research purposes. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe you could write it off on taxes? Probably. Yeah. I don't, and I think most of the world we don't want this to become a standard. Okay. okay. Don't so, buy this movie. Okay. So there, uh, we'll try and see if we can do this as short a time as possible, but yes. there, there are multiple things to talk about. So first let's talk about it as a film. I think in terms of whether people want to watch it or not, that ultimately is going to be decided on whether people recommend it as a good movie or not. So yes. let's start there and then let's get into a little bit of the, the broader implications. So as a film, I found this really, really disappointing. I agree. You and I were both a little bit skeptical going in. I would say that we had no expectations, maybe hopes. Uh, I had some hope going in. I had I had some hope going in, for sure. Yeah, because like we already knew going in that things were going to be different. It wasn't going to be the... I uh, thought this was going to be <laughs> the saving grace of the live-action films. Oh, Cameron. Oh, Cameron, you, 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 <laughs> you sweet, naive child. Bless your heart. Uh, I definitely did not have that hope. I was just hoping it would be entertaining. Yes. <laughs> and unfortunately, it wasn't. But, look, 
we knew going in it wasn't going to have the songs. We mm-hmm. knew going in that it was going to be a, a different plot going up against like a, a mystical villain. Mm-hmm. And I will give it credit for not trying to just do a shot by shot remake. I mean, I think that was the most disappointing thing about The Lion King was that it was just flat out the exact same story, almost nothing changed. Mm-hmm. So at least in this, they tried to do something different. I don't have a problem with them cutting out the songs. I don't have a problem with them cutting out like Mushu, recognizing like the, especially the cultural insensitivities around that character. Yes. I don't have problems with them making changes. And also having, you know, they're not, this is a story based off a story. So yes. they have more to pull from if they need it. Yes, exactly. My frustration was ultimately that they just took out all of the stakes, the the dramatic stakes and the emotional stakes. I wasn't invested in Mulan's relationship with her dad, which I think is uh, ultimately the heart of the original movie. Um, they even giving us more time with the dad, and and I still didn't really care about him. Yeah, and and you know the that character even in this movie is is charming and likable, but I just the the I didn't feel that they had a bond. I just didn't feel the chemistry between them. I didn't really feel the chemistry between any of the characters between um, uh, Mulan and the the new love interest. Didn't really feel anything there. I didn't feel that you know whether she got caught or not had any real personal stakes to it. Um, and you know you have really charismatic actors in this too. I mean, it has Donnie Yen. We we stand Donnie Yen. Yes. He's amazing. And, you know, go, you can go to any of his filmography, but even just, you know. That means you're including the Triple X sequel. I haven't seen that. Is he charming in that? <laughs> of course he is. It's, well, of course. It's a Triple X movie. It's, <laughs> we're not going down that path. This is already going to be a long enough segment without going down a Triple X hole. But also the phrase Triple X hole. <laughs> no, nope, you know. There's a lot of implications. <laughs> we're going to skirt past that. But. You know, Donnie Yen, you go to Star Wars, right? He is so good in Rogue One. Like, he is so effortlessly charming and lovely in that movie. And none of that's here. And, you know, uh, Jet Li is in this movie. Jet Li is a, a fantastic actor and, and so charismatic and, and brings so much to screen. And he just, you barely even recognize that he's there. And ultimately, I just there was nothing here to... Um, keep me engaged um it just feels really really flat um you know and i was hoping too that it would be action-packed like this was the opportunity for disney to like lean into genre and really play up the martial arts and unfortunately there's not a lot of really impressive martial arts on display well, we, here i i will i will caveat that by saying the the choreography is there mm-hmm. the I, like you can see them referencing and pulling from famous Chinese films. Yeah. The problem is the editing doesn't match. Yeah. And that, that was a big problem we had through most of the film. Yeah. You pointed that out very early on. That's Western editing. And it really uh, just chops up the action. Yeah. It just makes it, it makes it hard to follow. It makes it, cause you like, we paused and you asked me like, is something wrong with the TV? I, yeah. <laughs> I, I asked you if motion blurring was on, um, which is a, a, a setting that if you should check your TV, if you have it on, turn it off. It is the setting that like they put on TV so that sports like live sports looks great, especially on a showroom floor. But for any like scripted content anywhere, it's just going to make it look really crappy. Yeah. So yeah, check your TVs. The <laughs> Christopher McQuarrie and Tom Cruise put out a PSA a couple of years ago. Tell you everyone to turn their, uh, <laughs> turn it off. And you know what? They're right. Um, but yeah, just the, the action just didn't, it didn't carry anything. Like I, I just had a really hard time carrying it. And I might've cared more in a, in a, in a movie, like in a theater. I, there is definitely a, a, a separation that happens when you watch them at home. Yeah. Um, but I mean, but even factoring that in overall, the whole thing was just really half-assed. I agree. The, my big thing was like the symbolism. Cause Mulan, the animated one is, is chock full of like, great moments and icons Mm -hmm. uh and they technically had all of them in this movie and i even read a list like trying to find something to be excited about for this film of like here's 32 things you probably missed in the live action mulan it's like did you notice that she put her comb down in place of the scroll like she did in the animated series in the animated version i'm like yeah but the comb doesn't mean anything in this version yeah because we don't ever see it before yeah yeah, all the, the the beats and the moments that make the first one so memorable and so touching are uh, included in a very perfunctory way. Mm-hmm. 
here. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I'd say, probably my least favorite of the, I, the Disney. I might have to agree. I don't want to, because there's other yeah. films that I like a lot less than this. Yeah, I know. You know, I, I've been talking to a couple of my friends, and a lot of them are kind of lukewarm to okay with it. Yeah. And I feel like we are kind of the, the champions of the negative right now. Yeah, and look. So, you know, watch, watch on your own. I don't want to go into the super details. Not that there is something to spoil on no. a film based off a 25-year-old animated film based off of a 1,500-year-old an story. Ancient, yeah, an ancient legend. Um, but yeah, I, 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 you know, it, it is going to come out for free on Disney Plus in December. Yeah. If you are still interested, I recommend waiting for that. Yeah, I... I... I, I would not recommend paying for it, especially the given the price tag on it. Yes. And look, and look, I will acknowledge th- this movie was not made for us. Um, and that's fine. I don't expect everything to be made for you and I. Hey, as a straight white man, <laughs> I can't connect to any character in this film. As, Therefore, it is bad. And as an often mistakenly straight white man. <laughs> but no, like, I'm fine with stuff not being made for for us, or not, not even to say that, because that sort of implies like the the movie is indifferent towards you know having every audience see it. I'm fine with them making movies that are specifically catered towards people who haven't always been on screen before, um, and I'm totally fine with you know uh, making a big budget movie that's also frankly primarily catered towards China. Yeah, and in you know honestly, I would love to get someone else's perspective on this because I felt like the movie was trying to include Chinese culture, but I felt like the way they did it felt like a Western person's assumption of what is critical to Chinese culture, maybe rather than actually being really sincere. And I'm, again, I'm not the right barometer on that. So I would love to hear someone else's perspective on it. But like, to me, it just felt pandering maybe more so than, than sincere. So by all means, like if you have a different perspective, please let me know. Yes. Um, But at the end of the day, the problem also I had with it just wasn't, good doesn't ha- it doesn't have you for me i just expect things to be well made and this is possibly the the worst case like the worst example yet of uh, just a really cynical cash grab on disney's part yeah so all that being said there are other bigger implications in terms of how they chose to release this movie and, and i know that's something you are very um passionate about so yeah it, it's just the idea of potentially making this a standard of exclusive paywall content yeah so not only is this a film that is going to cost a little bit more than your average film but is also stuck behind an, a pre-set up pay- paywall like you can't buy this on itunes or amazon yeah you have to be subscribed to disney in order to get this film yeah and and that's a very in ideal situation. Like I even had someone ask me like, Oh, did any movies come out on, on demand this week? And I'm like, well, Mulan, but like, if you don't have Disney plus, you have to shell out a subscription and you have to pay for the movie. Yeah. So, so realistically this movie was a $38 movie, $37. Yeah. Movie. But yeah. And, and you, you've, you've been bringing up a lot that like, this isn't a test for Disney. This is a test for Marvel. I, I am convinced that that is the case Mm -hmm. and and i i do as as you've mentioned that i do see that more and more Mm -hmm. of like having exclusive marvel content is is very much a possibility there's a lot to this idea of like premium paywall content because one is in these current circumstances i get it like i get why disney chose to do it this way they were desperate to make money it's the first time in what two decades they didn't have a profitable quarter Mm mm-hmm I get it. I get the need to do this. I understand trying to recoup some of their costs wherever they possibly can. I'm glad they're also going to eventually make it available for free. I understand the need to try and get like Black Widow out. Like, and I have still maintained that this is movie is ultimately about Black Widow. I understand the need to get that out because you have the entirety of the MCU riding on that movie coming out before too long. And you can't just keep pushing that off. Right. And, and and we've both rumored that the reason we're not getting the TV shows yet is because we need Black Widow first. Yeah, there might be something in that movie that sets things up. And and you know, there's also the 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 fact that you know I'm I understand the need to put stuff in theaters, but I'm also bothered by the idea that by doing so, you are encouraging, uh, frankly, dangerous behavior. Like people really shouldn't be going to a movie right now, mm-hmm. and putting a movie out is feels a little bit socially irresponsible 
while trying to be like financially responsible your company i get it's a really challenging decision we put in yeah i can it, look if black widow ends up getting put on disney plus i will understand why i don't necessarily love it and to your point there's the circumstances now which make it kind of reasonable but there's also the possibility that this becomes a new normal and now all of a sudden even once theaters are reopened again they could just decide like hey do you want to see the new Marvel shows, the thing that most people are probably signed up to pay for, or do you want to see the next season of the Mandalorian that's going to be behind a further paywall? This might yeah. set a very dangerous precedent that has nothing to do with the COVID situation. Well, I mean, even going off the danger aspect of that, what's extra frustrating is it's only really dangerous for us as Americans. For these companies, they're in this really uncomfortable position because the rest of the world is now open. And you have an audience that has been stuck at home for a couple months with nothing really to do that is now chomping at the bit for media. Yeah. And it's unfair to them that because we're doing such a bad job that they have to suffer the consequences of like these pushbacks. Yeah. I, but also to be fair, like the areas that are starting to reopen, we're also seeing like, like, spikes happening again we're seeing like yeah. further subsequent lockdown so i think regard like basically the reality is until a vaccine you shouldn't be going to a movie theater mm -hmm. a vaccine that <laughs> has been tested and proven <laughs> exactly and not proven not a effective tax vaccine that's not just bleach um also i say all these things now talk to me again in november if bond still comes out <laughs> that is another big thing is all of these studios pushed everything back to november december yeah we are now two months away from probably the biggest month ever in cinema yeah yeah and the basically the question becomes like will they buckle or will they hold the line and it seems like they're gonna hold the line and yeah. just deal with the consequences of it and so there, there's all those implications and you know we haven't even talked about the fact that by choosing to release this movie this way you are also missing out on a really culturally significant moment this is a all Asian cast, female director, huge big blockbuster. There is a moment for representation that we're still not seeing. You know, I mean, this is the reason why um, John Chu really pushed to have Crazy Rich Asians get bought by Warner Brothers mm -hmm. and be distributed theatrically rather than getting a bigger offer from Netflix because he wanted to have that moment where people could go to the theater and see something they haven't seen yeah, before. The Black Panther thing, you know. Uh charity events going on to just get as many yeah. kids to see this movie in theaters as possible. Yeah. And so, you know, by choosing to distribute it this way, you lose out on that cultural moment. You also potentially, you, you lose out on the precedent breaking nature of it as well, which becomes really critical. Like it's silly to say that, you know, black Panther now means that we're going to get more huge movies with you know black creators and black cast but it's true mm -hmm. in the same way that we're you know this movie could do that same sort of thing for you know for the asian community and that um crazy Rich asians did to some degree already like you are missing out on being able to look at this as a box office success which i think it pretty much would have been yeah i mean as regardless. i said before this was probably supposed to be a billion dollar film yeah or, or after seeing it i don't think it might have made a billion dollars i know but I mean, but yeah disney prepped it to be a billion dollar film it would have done well and it would have opened further doors and you know and compounding that possibility if this in fact is a test bed for black widow and if black widow does get released in the same way you get the same fallout and you get the same missed opportunity and missed possibilities down the line um, look, I mean, it's, it's incredibly complex. What the fuck do the two of us know about this? Honestly, I draw pictures for a living. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I do this. Yeah. So, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, but there is a lot to dissect here. And, you know, I, I think beyond the fact that maybe we both found, we definitely found the movie, um, underwhelming, disappointing the way they chose to release it, um, is probably in the long run going to have more negative consequences than positive ones. I agree. Sadly. So. Oh, we did it. We did it. We have notes from friends. <laughs> yes, we got we got through Mulan talk, which everyone came here to see. Yes. Uh, to hear. Um, but yeah, so moving along, uh, final section here, some notes from friends. Uh, so one, I just want to do like kind of a shout out to you, Cameron. So we just put out uh, all of little the old me. little old you. We just put out your incredible artwork uh, for the Justice League that we're now going to be using going forward for all of our social channels. And we'll be using as templates um, for a lot of the episode art. And it is 
amazing. It, it like genuinely, I think I've said this for the podcast, but I'm going to keep saying it like, you know, your designs have always been incredible. They keep getting better and better. And like, you sent me the new ones and I, sw- I swear to God, I thought you had literally just like copied and pasted a picture of Batman's head and put it on there. Cause it is identical. They, the character has so much personality. It's so fantastic. We're getting a lot of love from them and put them out on um, Twitter and Instagram uh, as part of our celebration of our, our pod anniversary. at everyone's been really, really loving them. Thanks guys. Um, and I think uh, my, my personal favorite comment we got was from the guys over at the, the watchtower database. They said, I'm currently imagining all these microphones walking forward in silhouette with traffic music playing. And it's reminding me of the way the vegetables walk in veggie tales. It's absurd. And I'm here for it. Yes. <laughs> Are we even talking about the intro? We Whatever. didn't even talk about the intro. We'll get, we'll get to it, we'll, we'll get it next, next week. week. <laughs> We've already talked about enough stuff. Um, but no, I, I loved that. I thought that was uh, just a really fun comment. And you know, the, the art is amazing. And just thank you everyone for, for writing in nice things now to I say. Now I want to make Justice League Veggie Tales. Do it. I believe in you. Uh, but yeah, I also wanted to do, like declare very uh, you know properly that it's it's Cameron does all the artwork and it is absolutely amazing. So you have him to thank for that. Um, but we also got another message from, from Maddie, from good old Maddie Washburn chiming in. Um, cause he had a, a cool little comment to make about the static shock finale. Oh, we yeah. were talking about the fact that we found it like a little bit underwhelming and maybe not fully resolving, um, the sort of stuff we wanted to see. So, but he in, uh, he wrote in to say that Dwayne McDuffie was pretty vocal about disliking the final season of static as well as the finale itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's gone on record to say that he feels the show hit its stride in season three, but the network gave him a crap load of notes in season four. Um, and it ultimately just didn't really land the way he wanted it to. Um, and he actually had an idea for how it would have gone, which is that his original ending would have had Static confronting the uh, the guy that killed his mom and having to be talked down by Robert. Oh. Yeah. So that was his original ending suggestion. And I guess he had some ideas, like kind of like retcon those final two episodes to kind of make that whole thing work. Um, I think that would have been a much more emotionally impactful way to bring things full circle and to wrap things up than a, a lackluster cure plot line. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. Yeah. Because would he still be free? Or would this be like a guy that just got out of prison? I mean, yeah, we don't know. Escaped prison? We don't really know much about who killed his mom. We just know that she died, but we don't know any details of of what happened to that person after the fact, if they Mm -hmm. ever faced any kind of justice. So, yeah. No, it would have been really interesting to see um, how that could have played out. Uh, So, no, thanks for writing in, Maddie. And then uh, also, uh, good old Ashley Clark sent us a message, too, um, because she had some suggestions for baby versions of shows oh yes please share so she would love to see kidified versions of all the mike sure shows so specifically the office parks and rec and brooklyn 99 oh i i a kid oh my god as their as their hall monitors yeah brooklyn <laughs> yes. um i was gonna say parks and rec would be adorable as just i i could imagine that as is similar to like recess where it's it's just kind of like the kids that that handle like how how balls get distributed across the the playground yeah oh, i think it'd be God. very very cute and very funny oh uh, yeah the idea of like doing brooklyn 99 babies you can mm-hmm. keep the cast yeah and of course the office it's just them in class it's them it's it's just them in like study hall yeah no th- those are great great suggestions so uh thanks ashley we appreciate that uh, but no, but that does it from Notes of Friends. So if you have thoughts on Justly League Premiere, uh, if you have thoughts on Mulan, if you also have ideas for what would make great babyfied versions of shows, you can find us at Tim Talk Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Gmail. Yes. Uh, also going to announce that after four years finally, I have slightly expanded our distribution. So we are now <laughs> also up on uh, Google Podcasts and on Stitcher. <gasps> very hit the premium baby yes very exciting uh yeah so that you have new means of seeing the show now and don't worry uh, it's still up on youtube as well i just have to do it by hand <laughs> <laughs> more work for me yay uh, but yeah so we're still up on uh, apple Podcasts and spotify as well awesome so. yeah and if you want to find me i am lordifer on twitter and instagram yeah and if you want to see my art you can find that at cameron.dexter yeah that's right yeah and if you want to see my face you can find that at cam dexter underscore adventures <gasps> boom 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 well that does it we'll be back next week for uh the next episode of justice league blackest night darkest night yes darkest night <laughs> uh starry night yep it's just them looking at van gogh for two episodes <laughs> i would watch that i'd watch that i would watch them watch that yeah yeah Uh, But thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, goodbye. Talk to you later.
Oh, there's we don't have a we don't have a. <laughs> 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 <laughs>